Hi, and welcome to another episode of Pennsylvania Voter Information Network. I am your host, Larry DeMarco, and today we are here with John Randolph, Legislative Coordinator of March on Harrisburg. John, thank you for being a guest on Pennsylvania Voter Information Network. Thank you so much for having me, Larry. So John, tell us a little bit more about March on Harrisburg. How did it get started? When did it get started? In 2016, many of the members of March on Harrisburg participated in a march uh, uh, organized by Democracy Spring. We marched from Philadelphia to uh, Washington, D.C. to get money out of politics. Uh, it was the largest action of nonviolent civil disobedience in the history of the country, but was not well covered by mainstream media. And our executive director, Michael Pollack, and Emily DiCicco, uh, during their arrest, uh, talked about forming a group to do a similar action to get money out of politics and end corruption in Pennsylvania. So they started with that idea and slowly formed it in 2016 over uh, the course of the summer. And uh, I came into the fold in October. Our first official meeting was in October and uh, right before the election. John, because this wasn't covered by the press, I confess, I don't know that I knew about this. So this uh, Democracy Spring, how many marched and how many were arrested and why? Uh, during the march over 10 days, 100 and maybe 30 miles, I think, was the entire march. Uh, there were about um, 100 people who marched from Philadelphia to Washington, D.C. But there were thousands that met us in Washington to participate, unions and other groups, uh, over the course of five days. And so in April of 2016, there were 1,400 arrests over the course of those five days. The first day, Monday, had close to 500 arrests. So it's the largest action of civil disobedience in the history of the country. And um, not much mainstream media coverage. So uh, we all felt strongly about the corruption of our uh, federal government through money and politics, and uh, we were truly inspired to come back to Pennsylvania and do something about it in, the, in our state. I think that's fascinating that that many people got arrested and that the mainstream media didn't jump all over this. Corporations, Larry, they own the media. When did March on Harrisburg get started? And tell us about that formation. So uh, Michael and Emily uh, were forming it over the summer of 2016. In October, we had our first uh, meeting. Um, and so we came together with a group of, a core group, a steering committee that um, uh, chose legislation to support in Harrisburg. And we chose uh, HB 722, the gerrymandering bill, because gerrymandering is corruption, and a gift ban for legislators, HB 39, uh, because in our state we're one of 10 states with no limitations on what our legislators can accept from moneyed interests. So that was uh, what we rallied around and we fought for uh, the last uh, this, this session. So we were live in this session in Harrisburg, uh, which is closing probably the end of this session will be in November. And we fought very hard to bring these uh, bills to the public's attention. Just to get a uh, concept as to time, the formation though was March of, I'm sorry, October of 2016. So at this time, you may have anticipated that Hillary was going to be elected. This was not a Trump reaction, a Trump election Correct. reaction like Correct. a lot of the indivisible groups. Correct. You were doing this even before that occurred. We were inspired uh, long before seeing corruption in the country and in our state. So yes, we were not inspired by uh, the Trump uh, election. This is something that has gone on for many, many years. Citizens United going back to the 70s and the Powell memo. This has been a concerted effort by the parties to control uh, the system uh, and they're corrupted by money and we need to get it out of the political system so that the, they will hear the voices of the people. And you have primary campaigns but you said you rallied around gerrymandering mm -hmm. and the money in politics 
a gift ban. A gift ban, and there was one more, if I understand, on your website. Uh, we uh, also supported automatic voter registration. Uh, so we, when we lobbied, we would talk about these three bills. But over uh, at the beginning, we realized in our Republican-dominated legislature that automatic voter registration was not being heard very well, uh, as opposed to the other two bills that had a chance to pass. But we will come back in next session and support a different form of automatic voter registration that can be heard and recognized by Republican legislators. John, I want to follow up on this tactic that you suggested, civil disobedience. Please give us a little more detail about what civil disobedience is. If I may, Larry, I would like to preface that with saying that we uh, worked very hard to lobby first. We did not just use civil disobedience uh, straight out. We, uh, our legislature has 253 members, 50 in the Senate, 203 in the House, and we lobbied about 240 of them personally. I organized as legislative coordinator uh, lobbying days where citizens were encouraged to come and we gave them a small training session in the cafeteria and sent them out to meetings and I saw people empowered uh, uh, by speaking to their legislators on things that they uh, felt strongly about. So we started with lobbying. Then we marched. We marched to bring these uh, this legislation to uh, the eyes of the, the media and uh, to the eyes of the people of Pennsylvania. So we marched to bring attention. Uh, when we found that there, uh, our legislators were not hearing our voices, or often there were certain legislators that refused to meet with us, I must say that the, legislator was, the legislature was very open to meeting with us. And several times, some legislators met with us several times, but there were key legislators that just refused and often refused to meet with any of their own constituents. Those, that's where we used nonviolent civil disobedience. So I don't want it to, I don't want to have the perception that that's something we start off with. We do it the right way and we try to get our legislators to hear our voices uh, the proper way first, but sometimes you have to force that encounter with a legislator who refuses to acknowledge uh, the voice of their constituents or the people of Pennsylvania. This has been part one of a three-part series. Please watch part two, where John discusses the March on Harrisburg tactic of peaceful marching, lobbying, and civil disobedience. Please don't forget to subscribe to PA Voter Information Network, where you will see more great episodes like this one.